There you go. Good. All right. So, uh, wow, that's loud. So uh, this talk in 2014, I did um, network behavioral anomaly detection, UBA or UBAN as it was then, UEBA now. So I took the same deck we did, started with in 2014 to talk about the benefits of NBAD and UBA. In this talk, we're going to talk about how to break it, how to break uh, NBAD, uh, how to break UBA, and then how to mitigate against those attacks. So a little bit about me. Um, in uh, I was active duty Navy from 1995 through 2005. I worked on Hornets for the beginning of that, Ford deployed, 9-11 happened, uh, went and spun up the network security group, got to be a founding member of the School of Roots, so I've won DEF CON more than most human being, uh, beings. Um, and then uh, left, did consulting work for DOD State Department, also did uh, uh, product testing for World Magazine for a number of years until that closed and journalism died. Um, I went to work for Landcope, which is where I uh, first spoke here at Converge in the uh, first years of Converge, and then left after the acquisition by Cisco uh, to form uh, Witfu. Um, what we're going to hit on today is uh, how does MBAD work, how does UBA work very quickly, um, the relationship between data poisoning, baseline poisoning, non-repudiation, how to protect against those things. We're going to go into uh, some specific attack scenarios and tactics. And then we'll open up to QA. Uh, this deck is up on Twitter, so I'm at Charles Herring, or if you go to charlesherring.com, I'll take you to my LinkedIn page. You can download the deck. It has the code in it for uh, the exploits. Um, real quick on how we detect things in cybersecurity. Um, Signature-based detection is when you inspect the object for a known pattern. There's an indicator compromise referenced. Um, in the food world, it would be like looking at your food and there's mold on it. So you know what to look for, you found it, there's a pattern match, and you can trigger on it. <clears throat> Behavioral-based detection is when you look at the uh, actions of the reference entities. A host is doing something that's known bad, and, um, uh, and you trigger on it. Or a user is doing something that's a known bad behavior, even though you don't necessarily know why or what the, uh, the campaign is. And anomaly-based detection is um, a deviation from normal. You do machine learning, that's how we define it today, that comes in, you look at patterns, you assign um, a reason for that pattern. Could be network scanning, could be uh, benign, could be nefarious. But essentially all of this is taken from um, a 1986 paper written by Dr. Dorothy Denning at the uh, War College. And it really hasn't changed that much. Uh, marketing's messed with some of the words, but uh, these are the three detection methods we'll look at today. Um, <clears throat> Known exploits are best caught by signature detection. If you know what the hash is and the hash is matched, you know what it is, you know what the exploit is, very high fidelity in detection, uh, detecting known exploits. Um, O-day or not yet known exploits are best to taste, uh, detected by behaviorals in that the way that you're doing an exploit is the same, but the uh, payload or the subsequent behavior uh, that comes after the exploit is, net, uh, is the same, right? They're gonna, encrypt your disk, or they're going to delete files, or they're going to exfiltrate data or something along uh, the attack continuum. Um, when you're looking for anomaly detection, you're talking about pattern changes, that something normally happens. A user normally shows up uh, at a certain time, logs in at a certain time from a certain location, and then deviations from those known patterns can tell you when human beings are acting differently, uh, which can be an indication of credential abuse or insider attack. When uh, in doing anomaly-based detection, you have to build baselines. Or another way of saying that is the baseline is the calculation of normal. Um, what, is, uh, what is the normal time a user or a set of users should be logging in? And it, it takes time to build these. The longer the baseline exists, the more reliable uh, the baseline is. Uh, supervised machine learning is looking at very specific uh, data points and uh, building metrics on those data points over time. Unsupervised machine learning is looking at all permutations and uh, permeations of data to look for new things and new different, uh, different calculations that we didn't know before. Um, network behavioral uh, anomaly detection came around in 2002. It was the first time uh, we started talking about that. It generally works off of metadata because it's only building patterns. You only need to know how many bytes are exchanged, and so you can do most of that inside of the TCP header space. 
and uh, the advent of NetFlow, IPFIX, CFlow, JFlow, all these are records that represent um, communications um, uh, from route switch infrastructure became a really good place for this and it allowed visibility on horizontal uh, communications or east-west communications inside the network. Um, they're quantity specific, so how many packets, how many uh, bytes, those types of things. It doesn't really matter what's inside of the packet. It doesn't matter that there's an exploit um, inside of the uh, payload. It matters how many uh, payloads are occurring. If you want to look at the pattern itself, that would be signature-based detection. Um, sometimes you hear embedded refer we refer to as NetFlow security tools. <clears throat> uh, this is a list compiled by Gartner of different tools that do this. Mine's the uh, bottom one. I used to sell Cisco StealthWatch uh, at the top. Um, when you're looking for what type of anomalies are in the wild right now inside of embed programs, you're looking for service traffic uh, threshold anomalies, how much web traffic is being exchanged between the internet and the web servers, how, many, uh, how much data is accessed from the internal data stores, those types of things. Um, same thing with service. Uh, geographic traffic anomaly is we normally only get uh, 100K of traffic uh, to Tehran or uh, some other geographic region in a period, and now we have three times standard deviation of that traffic, so there's an anomaly um, in where in the world we're receiving traffic. Uh, data hoarding or data staging is a, a host or a group of hosts. How much data do they cons consume from the internal network uh, in a given period, normally a day? Uh, uh, data disclosure or exfiltration is how much does a host normally send out of the network to the internet in a given day. So those are very common uh, types of baselines to build and detection that goes inside of um, anomaly detection. UBA is an extension of it. Uh, it used to be called UBAD. There was a division between network behavioral anomaly detection and user uh, behavioral anomaly detection. And now it's all really wrapped into uh, user entity uh, behavioral analytics. But it just looks at, uh, beyond looking at IP addresses and hosts, you're now looking at uh, the access of users to files, um, uh, host to host, host to user, host to files. Um, this is a list compiled by uh, Security Planet on stuff that's currently doing um, UBA um, today. This was uh, last year's paper. Uh, things you're looking for there are like magic carpet attacks, someone logging in from, um, from China when they've never logged in from China before or they're logged in from China and now they're logged in from the Detroit office, so how do they move that fast physically across the globe? A time of day, users that log in at 8 o'clock in the morning from 8 to 10 every morning and now they're logging in at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday uh, presents a potential type of uh, anomaly that needs to be addressed. Um, which host are users accessing? If a host logs on the network and they're only hitting SharePoint and they're only hitting um, uh, the internet, why are they now accessing uh, route switch infrastructure or something along those lines. Uh, what type of data are they accessing? Uh, when you look at uh, user to file level access, who's hitting the information that holds PII or source code or something along those lines? Who is accessing it and, uh, and how? And as also service access, if uh, maybe they only hit email, LDAP, uh, web services, and now they're starting to log into SSH or something else that's outside the pattern of a given user or set of users. <clears throat> so what we're going to look at today is data poisoning. Um, whether uh, most of these features with NBAD and uh, U UEBA are not standalone products in general anymore, they are features of what we've called SIM, uh, uh, security incident event management tools over the years. Um, but there are a handful of standalone products. Um, things we're going to look at is map, mass implication. So what that generally means is my host or my user is doing something nefarious, but then I generate data that says everybody's doing that thing. So you can't pin it on me because it looks like every single user or every single host is doing that, so you can't isolate uh, the data. So it poisons the usefulness of the data in the system. Uh, baseline boiling is... Um, in anomaly detection, you're looking for an, uh, exceeding a defined baseline. So when you boil the baseline, as you expand the baseline over a period of time, so that when you want to trigger the exploit, the baseline is now grown to a place that will allow you to get away with it. And so that may be data staging, where every day you're collecting a little bit more data, a little bit more data from a set of hosts, and then when you're ready, you're finally ready to extract the real data 
uh, you have the flexibility in the baseline. Attack masking is when you're doing one type of attack, but then you generate fake records that make it look like something else uh, that uh, makes it uh, uh, makes the responder unable to determine which is which. Uh, the ways of achieving these in this system uh, that I'm going to show today are log spoofing, so just different methods of generating fake records that poison the data to accomplish these, uh, these attack types, or behavioral spoofing to where the things that are generating logs are tricked into thinking that uh, you're performing the bad behavior. Um, a couple places for generating traffic is either on a machine, a VM, container, so something you own inside the network, or tricking a networking device into doing this for you. Um, as far as mitigation, we're really talking about non-repudiation. And um, we have some hardcore challenges in data collection. Uh, we're still doing most of our data collection in cybersecurity over UDP. And so there's no, uh, there's no checking of uh, validity of that data. Um, you, we can ship, many uh, technologies ship uh, logs over TLS using client-based authentication. There's a lot of challenges with this. One, you have to maintain a PKI infrastructure to include revocation list or uh, doing that through um, uh, OCSP. Um, it also has the potential of breaking the network because TCP has the downside of having a handshake. And so if the, the host that's supposed to be collecting the data goes down, uh, there can be a negative impact on uh, the network. Um, some uh, route switches do uh, reverse path uh, verification to deal with uh, IP spoofing. So you'll see I'll do a good bit of IP spoofing here in a second. Uh, and so some of the uh, devices, this is the command from Cisco to enable on the interfaces to verify that the host that's saying it is a certain IP address is actually on that network. Um, another, another way of do, dealing with it is putting data, uh, your telemetry that's used in evidence collection in a segmented uh, part of the network, either through micro-segmentation or through uh, Cisco offers TrustSec for this uh, frame modification for validating a delivery of data. Um, honeypots are another good way because honeypots, and there's deception, a commercial deception technology like uh, TrapX is a good example of this, where you spin up trip wires throughout the network um, that have no valid purpose. And if something scans that machine, you know that um, it's being scanned because nothing should be communicating to a non-existent host. And if it does something, if it sends an exploit to that, to that honeypot, you have, there's a no false positive situation in Honeypot, so they can help figure out um, when, uh, when data's been uh, poisoned, who is the actual, what host and what user is the actual uh, culprit. Um, as data's being ingested into solutions like Splunk or QRadar, Logarithm, or Product iPedal, um, you want to tag how you got the information. Did it come in via UDP? Did it come in via TLS? so that if you run into a data poisoning scenario, you're able to filter out the stuff that you cannot be sure was delivered uh, correctly and then work only off the data uh, that has a strong non-repudiation. Another way of dealing with it is putting in secure uh, visibility frameworks. So Gigamon's a good example of this. They you, uh, tap your infrastructure and then they create uh, metadata directly off of the tapped uh, network traffic. And so in that way, uh, none of these attacks would work in that, this scenario because it's working off of um, uh, mirrored or a span a tap traffic. So as far as the attacks we're looking at today, they're applicable through uh, the attack continuum outside of initial access. All of these require um, uh, a machine inside of the network to do these attacks. They don't necessarily have to be privileged machines. They can, some of these attacks will work on wireless network, uh, guest network, and that type of thing. So uh, the first technique is, uh, is a pump and dump uh, scenario. So you bring up a, normally a VM or a Docker container, and uh, you assign a, a MAC address to it. Um, you assign an IP address to the machine, and then you do, some, you do something. Maybe you're doing recon, looking for, um, for SQL servers, but you do something, the machine is going to get reported, but then you kill that container spin up with a new MAC address, spin up with a new IP address, and now the machine that they're looking for has uh, disappeared off the network. Um, and uh, anyway, yep. so one way that you can, the only real mitigation against this is if you're doing logging at the access layer, so the access switch or the access point 
um, for wireless is logging the, the, the MAC address and other characteristics of the uh, host. So this is really simple to do. Um, if you install Docker on any host, the first command I have here um, uh, creates a new network. So uh, actually, this should be Docker create. No, this is creating. No, this is creating a host. So it creates a host um, on the network of the host. So whatever machine you're on, it physically binds to the network card. That's what network host is. The driver is the host machine. You establish what the MAC address is for this Docker container. Uh, the next part is just telling you which Docker image to use. So that would do that would download the newest. Um, release of Kali Linux. And this could be anything. You don't have to use Kali. You could use any flavor of Docker you wanted. It could come from your own repository. And then it just gives it the name of uh, Kali1. And then uh, you start it and execute. You can do stuff, stop it, and then just rerun that first command. So you can swap out your MAC address, swap out your IP address. And this is a common tactic we'll use on uh, additional uh, attack scenarios uh, going forward. Um, this one's really cool in a day of um, containerization is you can do what I call a pocket dimension. So on a single machine, you create a network that can be um, a slash zero. It can be the whole world uh, as a network. But it's bound to the network card. So if you're connected to an, uh, to an access point or to an access layer switch, it's going to see the traffic as if it's happening on the switch. But uh, you spin up one host, for instance, that may be on the Internet, so give it a 4.4.4.4 you know, .4 .4 address, and you have a 10 dot, you know, an RFC 1918 address internally, and you're communicating on this fake network. And uh, what that's doing is it's generating records in different scenarios that look like external traffic is happening around the world or inside of the network, but it's really not happening at all. It's happening on your single machine, but the telemetry about those metrics are being generated inside of this pocket dimension. And setting that up is pretty easy. Uh, so. Uh, you cr you do, uh, use Docker Network Create, and on Network Create, you define um, the principles of the network, what, what subnet is it on, um, what is it bound to, and then you have a, a, essentially a virtual network there. It can be a slash one, a slash two, a slash four. It can, you can create multiple, diff uh, multiple networks for different subnets, but you essentially build um, networks in, uh, using IP space that is routable on the internet so that you can perform attacks that uh, should, not be a, should not be observable. So the next thing, so I create a, a Docker network called Pocket, and then I, I spin up a Docker container called Kali1, and assign it an IP address of 4.2.3.1. And you can also, in the scenario, assign uh, the MAC addresses as well as we did earlier. Then I have another host in that Pocket domain called 10.10.10.1. And then I start both of those containers. And as you're doing the work inside of that, uh, inside of that pocket domain, it's it will generate metrics depending on how the telemetry is set up. We'll look at some ways of doing that in a second that look like things are happening that are not really happening. So you can, have a, you can, you can make it look like um, China is attacking your network when China is doing nothing. Right? You take a GOIP address, you assign it to one of the containers on the pocket dimension and then you've set up a, a test bed for generating telemetry to confuse logging solutions. Um, another technique that we can use is log spoofing, which is communicating directly to the logging source. The challenge with this is you have to find the, the collector. So the thing that's listening for syslog or the thing that's listening for um, NetFlow or API calls, the thing that ingests data. So you can do traditional recon stuff like DNS, uh, DNS uh, zone transfer type of dumps, looking for um, how information is being uh, 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 gathered. You can just do a, a SIM scan for syslog running on 514 TCP to look for those sources. Of course, that's going to be noisy, so if you're going to do that, do a pump and dump. Um, and then you essentially just send it artificial records that will accomplish what you want it to accomplish. Authentication successful, different whatever we're going to do. Um, of course, ACLs are important here. Going back to not allowing any guest network machine to get to your logging server would be a great way of doing this. And then not disclosing where those things are on the network through obfuscation is another approach. This is a very simple way to spoof a syslog message. So uh, and uh, essentially, you echo uh, a message to Netcat, and you point it to the place you wanted to go to. It looks exactly like a server log. Anything in UDP 
Uh, syslog can be generated this way. You can do CEF messages. So the stuff in the quotation marks is the syslog message that's going into um, the syslog collector. So very simple approach uh, from net, uh, using Netcat. There's an open source project called Samplicator, and uh, there, that's the link on GitHub to get it. You, it opens up a port or multiple ports. You put in rules, and you can send um, UDP packets to multiple destinations, and it will maintain the original uh, IP header. And so where this is helpful is you can uh, have it uh, send it everywhere. So you send one packet into Samplicator, and it can potentially send out to thousands of different sources, hoping that one of them is your log collection source. This only works with UDP, but it, is, it works with UDP over, uh, syslog over UP, NetFlow, IPFix, SNMP, all of that. Um, TLS is a little bit more complicated, but you can still get uh, data into a, a TLS listener um, because even when TLS is uh, used, it's typically not doing authentication. It's not authenticating the client certificate. If it is, then you would need to add the client certificate here. But this is just some shorthand. This is this is functional Python code. Um, you create a socket. You're using TLS v1. Um, you're not verifying the uh, server certificate because we don't care in this scenario. Uh, you open up the socket to 10.10.10.1 on 514 or wherever it is, and then the write command is the message that's being transmitted over TLS um, to the logging server. Um, if you have API-based collection, like Elasticsearch uses uh, uh, REST API, uh, Splunk uses REST API, so if you find the locations of these and you want to post in, it's just an ex post command. The um, dash K is just to disable certificate verification. And you just post the JSON object of the message that you want to go into the system. So that's curl. Um, NetFlow is a little trickier just because of the nature of NetFlow. But if you spin up a pocket dimension, you download uh, nprobe, and you want run nprobe on one of the NICs inside of the pocket dimension, it's going to sniff the traffic going in your little imaginary network and it's going to generate NetFlow records and send them to the place you want them to go to. So if you wanted to um, look like China was downloading all your data, picking on China again, you create a host in the pocket domain, have it download data from another imaginary machine, it's going to drink, generate the NetFlow records, and then forward those on uh, to the NetFlow collector. So the nprobe command is just what, what interface am I sniffing on? Um, and then where is the collector and what port is the collector on, and it will send the, uh, the uh, packets uh, directly into that collector to poison uh, that data. So taking that into account, um, doing an in-bad mass implication on a, on a network scan. So um, let's say you have a real host, you want it to scan the network, but you want to cover up the tracks by saying everything is scanning the network. So as the responders are looking to come after your host or kick it off the network or find you, um, they have to go through every fake host that you also generate records on. So um, the quickest way to do it is to spin up a pocket domain, have multiple uh, scanning machines with different IP addresses across different domains, um, use nprobe to send the NetFlow out of the, uh, pocket, uh, the pocket dimension uh, to the NetFlow collector. So you're scanning all these fake addresses inside of the, uh, the dimension as you're scanning the same addresses on the real network. And so you're generating real NetFlow records about uh, what you're actually doing, but you're also creating NetFlow records about a whole bunch of fake accounts that are not being generated. And so as responders are coming in, they have to find all these fake machines and get them off of the network before they can find uh, your machine. And really, IP spoofing is probably the only thing that's going to help you here. Um, and, and also, MAC address logging at the access layer on NetFlow. Um, but this is, uh, and then also tagging it, tagging the data, going back and knowing, being able to filter out which data was collected um, uh, from those NetFlow uh, records. Another one is a, is a NetFlow masking attack. So let's say you're doing a SIN scan. You have one machine doing a SIN scan, and then you're generating NetFlow records generating the SIN acts. So the way a, a SIN scan generally gets detected um, inside of an embed solution is you see so many SIN packets going out to destinations with no return SIN act. And so do the scan in the real world to discover a host, 
and then in the pocket dimension, generate NetFlow records that are just for Synax and send those directly to the flow collector. Or if your pocket dimension is running on an access layer switch, the access layer switch will generate the NetFlow records for you instead of you using Enprobe to do it. So you're scanning in this fake world, a 3850 from Cisco or something else will generate uh, NetFlow and automatically send it to the flow collector. Um, and one way to, to use this would, would be a honeypot. So if someone's scanning and then you have a connection that it hit a fake address, that network connection inside the honeypot and the forensics coming out of that would help um, determine what the real attacker was uh, from the fake. Uh, baseline boiling, same types of techniques. It just takes a lot of time. <laughs> so you, you basically, every day, you increase the metric that you're generating either in the pocket domain or on the real network. So you can download a mega traffic on day one, then a mega, half, a mega and a half on day two. Um, when you're dealing with different technologies, some of them build baselines on a per entity ba basis. So every host has its own baseline. Um, other technologies use set-based uh, baselines, so all of the wireless hosts share a common baseline. So when you're boiling a set-based baseline, you need to have more uh, participants um, in the boiling. But the idea there is if you need to do long-term systemic exfiltration or staging, um, you're going to want to boil the uh, set metrics by spending 30 or 60 days slowly incrementing up the byte count. So download meg, two megs, five megs, 10 megs, until you get it up to uh, the level you need for exfiltration. Um, alternatively, alternatively, most baselines do not, or most counters uh, for a given period do not exceed a 24 hour period. So if the baseline is um, 10 megs a day, you transfer 10 megs a day and do that every day, then the counter is gonna reset at midnight and then you've got another 10 megs for that day and then another 10 megs. And these can also be used in uh, combination with each other. So if you have the time to do a slow exfiltration, that's generally the best way to do it for avoiding um, anomaly-based detection. So with all those in mind, perfect. Um, Setting up the architecture around uh, TLS is really important. A lot, uh, the problem with this is NetFlow doesn't support it even in the RFC. IPFIX supports it in the RFC, but I've never seen a vendor create IPFIX uh, that supports TLS, though it is in uh, RFC 5101. Um, but using TLS where you can is important. You can also generate NetFlow off of the visibility fabric where you can control uh, the flow of data, so Gigamon or another TAP technology that's inspecting the data, creating metadata off of the raw TAP um, is a way to get the data out into a different format, maybe a common event format over TLS for syslog. Um, if, uh, if, and wherever you're using TLS, you want to make sure you have CRLs in place, IP spoofing as we already hit on, and then micro segmentation and ACL. So that is 30 minutes. Any questions? See you at the bar.